our What's My Health Score uh, Health Seminar. Today, uh, the topic uh, is uh, on stress, techniques to uh, de-stress your life. Uh, we uh, are pleased to have uh, <coughs> Leanne Geigel with us from uh, PHP. Uh, Leanne is a wellness uh, specialist and a wellness council coordinator. Uh, she's the important person who has helped us uh, last year, uh, put, or three years ago actually, put to, putting together our uh, first uh, wellness council here at Utah Department of Agriculture. And uh, you may recognize her, uh, she's been here before. Uh, she gave a presentation on sleep uh, not too long ago. Yeah. And she's uh, uh, consented to uh, give this presentation on stress uh, for us today. She's been with uh, Health of Utah for four and a half years. Uh, before that, she's lived in, um, in Richfield, Utah for 16 years, where she served um, uh, in the area of mental health and substance abuse uh, uh, prevention uh, for the Wayne Paiute and... Severe. Severe. I, yeah. I missed that uh, for that severe counties. She's uh, also worked for a IHC for 20 years uh, for health safety training uh, for child care workers. And in addition to all of this, uh, she uh, enjoys rock climbing. Uh, her second time she rock climbed, I believe, uh, yesterday. Last night, mm -hmm. And uh, she made it to the My top. My hands. Uh, indoor rock Lots of time. Two times. And so, uh, uh, with no more ado, let me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, turn the time over to Leanne. Thank you. I feel like I'm going to have to yell because you guys are so far back. Would you hate me too much if you came forward? Because my voice isn't really loud and I can't go back that far because he's recording me. I would just, I'd appreciate it. I know, I mean, sorry. But <laughs> if you really insist, I'm, I'm wondering if we can lower the lights a little bit yes. so we can see the slides better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, you guys. I appreciate it. I don't want to go back with laryngitis, you know, from yelling, so you feel like you're way out there. All right, I'm happy to be here today, you guys, and talk to you about using humor to manage stress, a, di a different way maybe to think about stress management. And I think we're going to have some fun today. We're going to just talk about stress, first of all, and then ways that you can find humor and use humor to de-stress and show a little bit of a video, not a little bit, it's a video that I think you'll find interesting and kind of entertaining and, uh, and go from there. So to begin with, am I yelling too loud for, because I feel like I'm yelling, but it's okay. Yell. Okay. I don't have to yell. I do feel like I have to for these guys though, because I guess I'm okay. Can you hear me back there if I sort of talk normal? Okay. <laughs> Okay, when we came into this world, we were blessed with the ability right at the beginning of our lives within weeks to smile, a few more weeks we're able to laugh. It's part of who we are. It's a natural innate ability that comes with us when we, when we are born. And think about it when you were a child as you're playing with your friends and you're looking for roly-poly bugs under the rocks and you're in the moment and just enjoying life and trying to, to just be present and laugh and enjoy. Kids laugh as much as 400 times a day. And as adults, we laugh maybe 10 if we're lucky. So what happens? Where, where do we lose all of that? Well, life happens for one thing, and you, you, you know, we start to have, it's hard to see that little dog under there, but certain expectations. <laughs> Certain expectations are put on us to perform well in the soccer game or, you know, at school, at piano recitals, you get peer pressures, you're getting a little bit older and you become more sensitive to that. You have to get those dang good grades, you know, in school and perform well. Then you start to date, you know, and it's that age where you just want to be so grown up and so, you know, you work so hard to look mature and be grown up, but when you get here, it's not that much fun, right? You have to go to work and be responsible for yourself, and then you get into relationships, and children come along the way, and financial stress hits, and life is just tough sometimes. It can be very stressful. I'm sure this time of year or any time, really, you would probably agree that life is stressful. So 
we live in this world that is demanding and depleting us of, of enjoyment and we feel disengaged and overwhelmed and that's just simply not fun. But um, so we're going to talk about stress and what it is. Um, it would be different for every one of you, obviously, uh, but it's when we feel threatened or when our life feels out of balance. I like the definition of it's the physical or the emotional response to change. What is ever more constant in our life than change? Um, but the takeaway from this slide is that it's not the situation that causes us stress, but how we respond to the situation. I heard Deepak Chopra talk about a little scenario that I'm going to share with you today. He said, just imagine you're up in the hills hiking, and all of a sudden this snake slithers out from underneath a rock. Um, you happen to hate snakes. And so you're going to have that immediate fight or flight response that your heart rate's going to increase, your blood pressure's going to be increased, your muscles are tensed and ready for action for self preservation. That's why we are built with that, that ability for that fight or flight response so that we don't die. I mean, it's, it's, it's self preservation. It's, you know, from caveman era. So, um, so you're out of there because you hate that snake. Same situation. So you're hiking up in the hills and all of a sudden you see this snake slither out from the rocks. Maybe, you know, you're a herpetologist and you're studying snakes and you might just observe it. You might actually move closer. You might pick it up, depending on how you feel about that. But this, the point being, the situation hasn't changed. Just the response to that situation is what's changed. And so, you know, as you think about that, you realize, I, I think I, I'm more responsible for how I, res I respond to in a stressful situation than I thought. I have more control over that than, and we all do, than I think sometimes we think we do. So I don't have to get angry at that driver for cutting me off in, on the freeway. I don't have to get angry at my son for leaving those dang wet towels on, the, on his bedroom floor that I've asked him not to over and over again. No, all these little stressors, we have control over and how we'll respond to them. So just remember that when you are experiencing a stressful situation. I think we don't really think of stress as being good but it really can be. They call it use stress. So it helps us to rise to challenges and keeps us on our toes and all of those good things. And so we really do need it in our lives to kind of keep us moving forward. But it's called use stress versus distress or what we call stress, that feeling that you want to choke the living daylights out of somebody who desperately needs it. So that's the, that's the difference. So we talked a little about the body's response to stress. Our blood pressure rises, our heart rate increases, breathing is shallow and rapid, uh, muscles are tense and ready for action, that glucose is released into the bloodstream so that it gives us the energy to hightail it out of there so we can live and run away from that woolly mammoth or the saber-toothed tiger, that adrenaline kicks in. Again, we're, we're glad that we're blessed with that ability. But the problem comes when we're, we're blessed with this ability to, have, to respond to an acute stressor and then have that relaxation response afterwards that just drops back down. The problem with today's society and today's stressors is that we, we tend to let those little stressors just build up over and over again and, and just um, keep more chronic and never have that relaxation response. It's less intense, but it lasts for a longer duration. And that's when we start to see some of the stress-related effects physically and, and emotionally. So a lot of the health problems that are caused from this, it's kind of like pushing down on the accelerator of a car. If you push down too long, too hard, keep that engine revved up way high, um, you're going to start to see problems with the car. Something's going to break down. And the same is true with our body. The long, when we stay in that chronic state of stress, you start to see heart disease and digestive problems and the whole list of things that are caused from being exposed to those stress hormones and that stress response. So one of the other things I think that contributes to um, our stress levels is that we are forced to deal with imperfect people every day and we are not well trained to do so. I do not know too many colleges or universities that teach you how to be a good son-in-law or a good father, a good mom, a good sister, a good friend. And who, who decides what good is? And yet the most important roles we play in our lives the ones we have the least amount of training for. And that contributes to our stress and, and defining what, it, what that looks like to be a good mom or whatever. I think these are some interesting job statistics that we'll take a look at. 
80% of workers feel stress on the job. Nearly half say they need help managing stress. So thank you for being here today. Hopefully this will give you some tools to help. 42% say their coworkers need that help. Yeah. 25% say they feel like screaming or shouting because of job stress. And 14% of respondents felt like they like striking a coworker in the past year. You know, you do have that muscle tension, and exercise can accommodate that with a good left hook. It could work, I suppose, but you know, that's not <laughs> appropriate, obviously. But uh, yeah, up to 90% of all primary care doctor visits are related to stress, 90%. But you saw that whole list of what the you know, effects of stress can do. Workplace stress is as bad for the heart as smoking and high cholesterol. Wow. 74% of employees are experiencing a personal energy crisis, increasingly overwhelmed, disengaged, or exhausted, overwhelmed, and disengaged. So yeah, it's affecting all of us. So life is meant to be fun. Let's have some fun and try to see the brighter side of it and, and break up with stress. So, um, so what do you do to do that? Well. You can take medication or take a vacation, bottle it up, do touchy-feelies, or you can do what this guy did. If you can read that. <laughs> a little passive-aggressive approach. So, or you can laugh. So that's kind of the introduction part into the laughter part. Um, so it diminishes anxiety, it helps strengthen our immune system, increases tolerance to pain, and we're going to talk about a, a, a medical study that, and a situation where that proved to be true. Um, it raises our oxygen levels, reduces the incidence of arterial blockage, angioplasties, and heart attacks. Laughter can? I'm going to show you. Study. And besides that, it just makes you feel much better, and it's better than the alternative, right? So let's talk about some stress management tools. We're going to put in this toolbox now, laughter. After today, you're going to hopefully use that one a little bit more. But sleeping for eight hours a night. We were here doing a sleep seminar not very long ago and talked about the important things that happen during the sleep cycle. That if you're not getting a good REM sleep cycle, that's when your, blood, your red blood cells are produced, that's when your muscles are regenerating, that's when your memories are stored, and, and it's important. And that's become a problem more and more for people. And um, yeah, kind of kind of dangerously so. Um, cutting down on caffeine. Um, when I worked in Central Utah at the Mental Health Center, we had a psychiatrist from Salt Lake that would come down every week and do the meds for our patients. And, and if he saw people bringing in big mugs of coffee or their big mugs of Mountain Dew and they were complaining of depression and anxiety, he would make them decrease their caffeine because of the effects that it had in contributing to anxiety and irritability. Um, Eating more fruits and vegetables, that's always important. We recommend five a day. Um, figuring out a way to get those into your diet every day. Exercise, you know, critical piece for managing stress. If I don't, if I go more than two days without some physical activity, I get irritable and I need to go for a walk or a bike ride or a climb now, you know. Who <laughs> so um, recommendation, 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So. Um, try to reach that. Maintaining a healthy weight, of course, all those things, if you do those, is going to help that. Tobacco use, uh, decreasing that. Quiet time and meditation. You know, we take a, a shower for our bodies, to get the dirt off our bodies every day, but meditation can really be like a shower for the mind. If you have that quiet mindfulness practice every day, um, or a few times a week even, just starting the day out or ending it to just sort of cleanse the mind and just refresh that. But bottom line is a healthy body is less likely to react to stress. So I love this, embrace and love your body. It's the most amazing thing you will ever love, own. So, you know, truly taking care of ourselves can absolutely help with that. You know, I think we don't really appreciate our health until we lose it. And then we start to worry about that. So trying to take a proactive approach to that. But getting back to mindfulness, where do you fit? Is your mind full of stuff? Are you thinking about a million things at once? Are you trying to multitask? Are you feel ruminating about things in the past? Are you are, are anxious about things in the future? I came across a quote that I really liked, and it, it it's kind of spoke to me because I've, I've struggled with anxiety and depression. And um, But it's, it said, if you're um, depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, 
you're living in the present. So I become aware of when I am getting to that place where I start to worry or I start, start to ruminate or I, something happens and I, the awareness pet fact, just being aware of that has really helped. And so becoming aware, then I will just start to breathe and become aware of my breath and just begin doing some deep breathing and it brings me back to present and that has made such a difference for me in reducing anxiety. So the mindfulness practice. So are you mindful? Are you mindful? The dog gets it. Look, he's, he's moving along, just being in the moment, enjoying the, the day. So we're going to talk about the social and the physical and mental health benefits of laughter. Um, socially, it strengthens relationships. It attracts others to us. It enhances teamwork and it helps diffuse conflict. And it promotes group bonding. I don't know about you, but we've got a big room full of cubicles, and, and if I hear somebody laughing over one of the coworkers, I mean, I gotta get up and see what's going on. And, and I wanna, it, it attracts people to us when we're, we're positive. The mental health benefits, it adds joy and zest to our life, eases anxiety and fear, relieves stress, elevates our mood, enhances resilience, dissolves, dissolves the distressing emotions, and you can't feel anxious and or you can't feel anxious or depressed when you're laughing. Biochemically, those hormones can't coexist, and so you, you, when you're laughing, you can't have the, um, the depression. So physical benefits. It boosts our immunity and lowers stress hormones, decreases our pain, relaxes your muscles, prevents heart disease. You're using 15 facial muscles, and it stimulates hormonal activity that can benefit the immune system. You can burn a lot of calories if you laugh 100 times a day, a good belly laugh. I don't know that any of us really can do that much anymore, but how great would it be if we could? Wouldn't it? It would be great. So here's the study that talked about how laughing can help heart disease. The University of Maryland did a study where they took 300 people, 150 with diagnosed health disease problems, heart disease problems, and 150 who were clear of heart disease. They put them in similar situations and compared how they responded to them. So one situation was where you go to a party and you see somebody there that's dressed exactly like you are. How would you respond? Um, another was you're at a restaurant and the waiter spills the water on you. How would you respond? Well, what they found, there were several questions similar to this. That the people with heart disease were less likely to recognize humor or use it to get out of uncomfortable situations. They laughed less, even in positive situations, and they displayed more anger and hostility. So if you're more stoic and you don't see humor a lot in things, you might be setting yourself up for heart disease. <laughs> I don't know. So you can kind of, it sort of makes a little bit of sense, right? When you're lighthearted, I mean, you literally, what that means, you're lighthearted, you're not taking things so, so seriously versus hard-heartedness and lightheartedness. There's some reality to that. So laughing gives us hope and uh, co power to cope and uh, keeps us balanced, provides perspective, and I like this, reduces hardening of the attitudes. So there you go. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry that I haven't written, but all my stationery was destroyed when the dorm burned down. I'm now out of the hospital and the doctor said that I'll be fully recovered soon. I have also moved in with the boy who rescued me since most of my things were destroyed in the fire. Oh yes, I know you've always wanted a grandchild, so you'll be pleased to know I'm pregnant and you'll have one soon. Love, Mary. <laughs> P.S. There was no fire. My health is perfectly fine and I'm not pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. However, I did get a D in French and a C in math and chemistry. I just wanted to make sure that you keep it all in perspective. I love Mary. I love, I think she's brilliant. She's brilliant. How many times do we take things out of the context of what they're intended to be? And how many times do we overreact to things that really aren't that big of a deal? I mean, it's, and save this, the stressful stuff for the serious things <laughs> instead of things that aren't that big of a deal. So I'm going to tell you about a guy named Norman Cousins. Some of you may have heard of him, but this was quite a while ago, back in 64. He was the editor of the Saturday Evening Review and had, um, had, was diagnosed with uh, angulosing spondylitis. Sorry, I usually can say it, but we're going to watch a video where they talk about that too in just a minute. They gave him six months to live. It's a very, very painful connective tissue disease. He surmised that if negative stress causes disease, 
What happens if we switch that and just go the opposite and just have positive stress all the time? So he checked himself out of the hospital and he went to a hotel nearby and he was monitored by the, the health staff and, and he checked out Laurel and Hardy videos, his wife did, and, and Three Stooges and Mark's Brothers. You can see how old this is. But he laughed and he would laugh for hours at a time and he found it relieved his pain, it reduced his, stre um, it reduced his pain level and helped him sleep. And even back in 1989, Journal of American Medical Association talked about laughter therapy and how it could improve the quality of life for patients with chronic illness. Now if you have somebody in your family who's struggling with chronic disease and pain, what a great way, thing to try. I mean, it's cheap medicine, right? And it, you, there's so many things available on YouTube that are hilarious. And so why not give it a try and see if that makes a difference in the quality of their life? He wrote a book chronicling the, his, his recovery. He actually cured himself. And it's called The Anatomy of an Illness. So it's kind of a fascinating story about Norman Cousins. We're going to watch a video of a woman named Loretta LaRouche. Now this is an old video kind of back in 64. <laughs> it's not exactly that, but it's old. And you'll, you'll probably get as much of a kick out of people in the audience as you will Loretta. She's a humorist who's, whose role and purpose she feels like is to stamp out irrational thinking and to get people to really take a look at finding humor in their lives and, and making the quality of your life better. So um, I think you'll enjoy this. Starts. Um, Hope you'll be able to hear it. There we go. It'll get louder in just a second. Hopefully. Can you hear it back here? There we go. Well, we're back for more laughter. Did any of you have to call people you don't like in, in between? just so you could suffer for a few minutes? Well, I think we're going to go back to our laugh and sort of recap it so we can get through the whole thing. And uh, this is very important, the laugh and the guffaw, because if this can really build up your immune system and help you throughout life. You actually can stack up, sort of have residual benefits. Well, Norman Cousins used this to help heal himself, but of something called ankylosing spondylitis, and that took me forever to even say. And he found that when he laughed for two hours, he didn't have to take pain medication for quite some time. So let's all try this. Are you ready? Here we go. Big toothy grin. Now remember, it has to be wide and toothy. Now I want you to show your molars. If you don't have any, show your gums. <laughs> and we need everybody to do this, including the men. Sometimes we <coughs> have a little bit of a problem getting involved and looking a little silly in front of each other. You know that routine. That's why they never ask for directions. <laughs> Joy yourself by looking at someone. 
somebody else. So look at somebody's face. Hang on to your belly. <laughs> and on the count of three, we're all going to go, oh, 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 And we're going to try to laugh for 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> oh. I don't know if I can handle that much joy. Well, see if you can handle it anyway. You ready? There we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. I was going to try 
try that because I loved it. <laughs> and I, I like to sort of do these things to my husband because he's much more conservative than I am. So I greeted him one night, stark naked, in wingtips. <laughs> And the first thing he said is, what are the neighbors going to think? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I haven't shown them yet. <laughs> but see, that's a typical response why a lot of us don't do a lot of things. Even laugh. I mean, when you're doing that a little exercise, how many of you feel foolish? Or you start to think, is anybody watching? I wonder if anybody's watching. I wonder if they are watching. Well, you know, they are everywhere, don't you? I saw them on, in a van coming up here in the expressway. <laughs> See, it's very easy to get tuned into they because you start, start learning this principle when you're a little kid. Little kids uh, here and there, they move around a lot. Don't they? they never stop moving. They make funny faces. But by the time you're three, you're given 350,000 notes. Stop it, sit down, be quiet. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Just who do you think you are? Do any of you remember the fact that you couldn't use the good scissors? <laughs> Please don't use my good scissors. Well, what does that mean? What pair should I use? I guess I should use the pair that don't cut. <laughs> you start to internalize that information, don't you? You start to put yourself on the back burner. You start to wait. Maybe there's a right time to do this. So you start saving stuff. Start waiting for a special occasion. I remember as a kid I had a pair of underpants my mother didn't let me wear. Because <laughs> they were too good. I still have them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point, is it, to keep them new so they stay in the drawer? You get to have an observance once in a while. <laughs> How many of you have good dishes? Nobody can sit at the table and use the good dishes, especially the family. <laughs> the family doesn't deserve these things. They get to eat off the chip china. <laughs> Drink it out of the jelly glass. <laughs> then when people you don't know come over, you say, hey, come on in. You can eat off these dishes. We don't know who you are, but this one. <laughs> How about the good room? How many of you tell your family, please, don't go in that room. I just clean. No problem. We'll sit in a filthy room. <laughs> Maybe we can go outside and look at the through the window of the clean room. <laughs> and then, most importantly, there's that real special occasion, death. Have you ever been to a funeral where people actually walk around saying, hmm, they look fabulous. <laughs> they never look this good. <laughs> Have you ever seen them look this good? That's because somebody finally went to their closet, got their good stuff, and put it on. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a special occasion. <laughs> Think of the rules and regulations so many of us are invested in from this committee that's up there <clears throat> judging, telling you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. How many of you made sure that you organized your home before you left today? Just in case. One of the things my mother always said to me is, you never know. <laughs> I don't know what you don't know, but you never know. <laughs> so of course you have to make your bed, because you never know. What if somebody stops by? What if the bed check has come up? <laughs> <laughs> so you go through your whole life with this fear that people you have never met might come over your house and check your beds. <laughs> And you tell people, I'm not going out. I didn't finish the bed. <coughs> I had 
some people in a workshop once who told me they could never leave their house until they did all the dishes. I said, take them with you. <laughs>
way you define yourself. Look in the mirror every day and say, how serious is this? <laughs> modern updated version of her she's still around um, if you google her or just uh, on YouTube you can see that little video clip or there's some other things too it's from a, a presentation she did called the joy of stress so um, she's she's uh, like I said her, her role is to stamp out irrational thinking and try to find humor in situations she has a website as well so she talked about the no humor cycle, where we have start with that irrational thinking. Every time we come to the grocery store, you know, it fills up with people. What, and then you start to become upset. And then you become anxious. And then depression hits. And then you, there's, bam, no humor. So that's Loretta's humor cycle. So Loretta has come up with some ideas and things that, that she thinks are helpful in trying to, to uh, combat that irrational thinking and, and depression and such. She said, make a joy list. Um, things that are relatively pleasant, easy to, easy to do. And so what is it that is your soul food? What nourishes you? And having those, that list of things in place in, at the time of crisis for you are just there. I, they say for positive mental health, everyone needs two things every day, time alone or time to yourself and time to do something you enjoy. But I think when we're in one of those Calgon take me away moments, if you will, that shows my age, but um, that you can connect into one of those things on that joy list 
that might help you feel better. Here's some examples of the things that nourish you. You know, listening to music, a hot bubble bath, getting, you know, rid of the kids for a little while, having freedom from, from children, or um, going for a walk, enjoying the sunset. There's a whole list of whatever that is for you. So um, think about that and maybe write that down so you have that joy list. Give the gift of joy. How do you show up at, at occasions, at work? At, I mean, are you the Debbie Downer? Or are you one that comes with, with some fun and some spark? Are, are you one that sees the, um, the cup half empty or half full? Do you see, is it partly cloudy or mostly sunny? What's the attitude that you show up with? Experiencing the joy of everyday life. We've had some amazing sunsets lately. I've thoroughly enjoyed them and, and we're stopping and smelling the roses enjoying the beauty and the day-to-day the -day things that we do um, that are out there for us to enjoy. <clears throat> Moving joyfully, um, thinking joyfully. Um, I lost my train of thought on that. Just, um, you know, the more we resist trying to, uh, to find joy and to, and to be grateful, the more it's kind of like uh, it becomes more vexing. It's like one of those finger pull things that you get in fishing ponds. You used to get it. You know, the more you pull on those things, the more you resist um, joy and fun, and the, the, the more difficult it becomes. And so when you just relax and, and, and enjoy life a little more, things become so much better. Um, yeah, so we looked at that. I think we need to get away from the idea that doing things for ourselves and self care. Uh, you know, we've got that idea that if, if I take care of myself, it's, it's selfish. And, and how does it hurt others when we do things for ourselves? It doesn't. It, it makes it better for everybody. I like this quote, taking good care of you means the people in your life will receive the best of you rather than what's left of you. So catch yourself thinking in a negative way if you, if you get into one of those <coughs> funks. Every feeling is preceded by a thought always. And own that only you can make you feel a certain way and, the, and you put the meaning into what the, that makes you feel that way. You're the one that adds that. Um, you have control over that. Replace that thought with an upgrade, with gratitude or with laughter. Every day you can find something to be grateful for. If you've got clean water and a roof over your head, you're way ahead of a lot of people up on this planet. So, you know, if you can buy a cup of coffee in the morning, if you can, you know, able to walk, there's so many things that you, you can be grateful for. And when you find gratitude, it, it's, it's kind of like an attraction. You know, you end up having more things to be grateful for. Create opportunities to laugh. You know, actually be conscious about that. Watching funny movies or going to comedy clubs. There's a, you know, list of things. Sharing jokes um, and humor. Hosting a game night goofing around with kids, um, go to a laughter yoga class. Has anyone heard of laughter yoga? It's a real thing, actually, that <laughs> was started in northern India. Um, it, well, it was, no, it was Mumbai, India. I don't know, actually, if that's northern or not. But uh, by a doctor there. Um, and he, he, with the attitude that laughter is healing and helpful, and so he, people gather in parks or in recreation centers, all over the world, they have laughter yoga classes. There's a World Laughter Day. And they, they do like what Loretta did at the beginning of her bit, video, where they fake laugh, <laughs> you know, and then eventually you start to really laugh, and your body can't differentiate between the fake laughter and the real laughter. And so you, you start to produce these hormones that make you feel better, and um, with the reports that they feel better and don't take their antidepressants anymore, or that life, they, their day goes so much better when they go to a laughter yoga class. I know of an instructor at Salt Lake Community College that's a certified laughter yoga instructor, and, and they, there's a class there that's actually a accredited class. Um, so doctors are, are realizing the valuable tool that laughter is, says this laughter yoga instructor. They should be writing prescriptions for this. So I came up with the prescription, laugh every four hours, for five minutes and repeat daily. So around us there's humor everywhere we go. Sometimes we just don't recognize it. But you notice as you're looking at different signs and different situations, what, you know, funny, funny things or humorous things. I like this one. <laughs> yeah, a little crazy. <laughs> These are real. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no mention about the important thing right here in the small print. <laughs> kind of crazy. the old David Letterman used to do. So number 10, laughter gets you out of your head and away from your troubles. Literally laugh it off, you'll feel better. Number nine, like laugh to strengthen your immune system. Your immune system's boosted for at least 12 hours after watching a funny moody movie. It's cheap medicine. Number eight, laugh to reduce stress and tension. Laughter really is a release. And this is actually a laughter yoga class that they do in the Senior Citizen Center. Um, Laugh because life is too precious to be filled with excess seriousness. Laugh to reduce depression. Your body <laughs> releases endorphins and you actually do start to feel better. Number five, there's no right or wrong way to laugh. Anyone can do it. There's no skill required. All those are laughter yoga groups. Number four, laugh to feel young again. Yes, laughter is anti-aging. Number three, laughter is one of the easiest and cheapest ways to relax your body. Number two, a good belly laugh is great exercise. It works both the stomach and the facial muscles. And the number one reason to laugh is because life is simply better when you're laughing. So thank you. Are there any questions for Leanne? <laughs> any, any jokes great, you want to share? That was a great applause. Yeah, anybody got any good jokes? <laughs> okay. All right, well, this, I, I just have a question. Or okay. Not a question, just a comment. When uh, we were doing this 30 seconds of laughing, or forced laughing, uh -huh. I guess, I don't know about you guys, but after it was done, I, I felt a little bit different. But did anyone else feel that there might, might have been a, a difference in your endorphins or whatever might be there? He participated. The rest yeah. of you in addition. <laughs> yeah, see, no wonder. No wonder participated. I know. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, that I think committee that's it. making you not want to do it. You just want to.